All right. Good, good morning, everybody, or, or good afternoon, I guess, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the Executive Director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. It's great to see a lot of students, uh, alumni, faculty, other supporters joining us here today. Um, and while uh, I venture to guess that most of you are intimately familiar with us, for those that aren't, uh, the Alexander Hamilton Society is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit national organization that seeks to identify, educate, and launch young men and women into the foreign policy and national security world imbued with the Hamiltonian perspective of strong and principled American leadership in global affairs. We operate first and foremost in college campuses across the country, where our student-led chapters host some of our nation's most eminent scholars and practitioners on U.S. foreign policy for debates with some of their very own faculty. Our over 50 chapters and nearly 200, host nearly 200 events uh, a year on campus, and our uh, nearly 1,000 alumni are serving across the national security and foreign policy space. If you're interested in learning more, uh, feel free to visit alexanderhamiltonsociety.org, uh, and we'd love to connect with you. Um, today, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, somebody actually I've known for, for 20 years, uh, uh, somebody I actually went to high school with, uh, and somebody I actually can, can remember uh, uh, fascination uh, and, uh, and in many ways domination with military history, uh, just really just outclassed all of us from a very young age, uh, and that is uh, Wesley Morgan. Uh, and Wes is the author of a phenomenal new book, uh, right here, The Hardest Place, uh, The American Military Adrift uh, in Afghanistan's Pesh Valley. Um, and Wes is a military affairs reporter who most recently covered the Pentagon for two and a half years at Politico, uh, previously worked as a freelance journalist in Washington, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's written for the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, The Atlantic, many other publications. Uh, and, and really, um, you know, in, in my view, uh, probably one of the models of the exemplars for uh, what young folks uh, who are interested in military affairs um, can do uh, really with their own uh, with their own uh, uh, proactive approach to things and their own just you know if you don't ask you don't get uh, and uh, and going and doing things that I think really make a contribution to our understanding uh, of uh, some of the American wars that we fought over the last two decades um, and so Wes it's really a great pleasure to have you um, and we're joined by somebody um, who not only uh, has gotten to know Afghanistan intimately uh, but who uh, also the book uh, has gotten to know intimately. Uh, and that is uh, General Joseph Votel. Uh, general Votel is a retired U.S. Army four-star general and uh, most recently the commander of U.S. Central Command, responsible for U.S. military operations across the Middle East and Central and South Asia, including Afghanistan. Uh, in addition to his nearly four decades of service in the military, uh, he proceeded his assignment at CENTCOM uh, with service as commander of U.S. Special Operations Command and Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, he's currently the president and CEO of Business Executives for National Security, uh, and he's a 1980 graduate of the United States Military Academy. Um, and it's really a, a pleasure to have both of you uh, here in conversation uh, about Wes's book and, and obviously, um, you know, to a certain degree beyond that, about, um, about the Mer American military operations Afghanistan the last two decades, um, and, and given the, the seems to be in, finally impending, uh, it seems like it's been impending for a decade, but uh, seems to be real this time, uh, finally uh, impending end of the American involvement in the Afghan uh, in the Afghan war, and so something we'll talk about. So really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, and before uh, I really jump in, uh, just as a reminder, everybody, uh, we will have time at the end uh, for Q&A, uh, and, and I will actually figuratively hand you the microphone, uh, i.e. unmute you for you to ask your question. Uh, but for you to do that, please submit your question in writing uh, in the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, in the Zoom um, so, so, uh, so we can know who's who. Um, and so with that, uh, Wes, why don't, I, why don't I actually start with you? Um, the, the genesis of most books uh, is usually actually a question, um, and a question that's not uh, so easy to answer. Otherwise, uh, you know, why would you actually have to go write a book about it? So for you, Wes, like, what is the question that generated this book? Uh, what what did you not understand? Or what did you want others to understand that they didn't at the time? Uh, that that's about, you know, the American involvement in Afghanistan? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it was indeed a question that generated this book. <clears throat> and it was a pretty basic question, but I think I have to give a little bit of background to explain it. <clears throat> so the, the Petch Valley is a place up in northeastern Afghanistan, about 100 miles northeast of Kabul, pretty near the border with Pakistan, um, that over the years in Afghanistan uh, became by kind of the middle of US involvement there a decade ago, really a, a, a place of very severe fighting um, that was made pretty famous by a lot of media coverage by you know, other journalists who came before me um, to include uh, the Sebastian Younger and Tim Hetherington who filmed the documentary Restrepo up in the Korangal Valley, it's very rugged terrain just south of the Petch. Um, some other events like the, the Lone Survivor event, Operation Red Wings in 2005. Um, so I, I first went to the Petch as, a, as an embedded journalist 
a freelancer in 2010 um, at what was kind of the uh, a little past the peak of U.S. involvement in this place. Um, and it, the place was just really striking to me. You know, I, at that point, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time already in different parts of Iraq and Afghanistan, but I'd never seen anything that looked like the Pesh, um, both in terms of just visually what the place looked like, the terrain, um, with these jagged mountains, uh, this, this greenery, these forests. I, I hadn't seen anything like that elsewhere. And then also just kind of the ferocity of the fighting. Um, you know, I, I'd gotten very used to uh, uh, the places in Iraq and Afghanistan where it was sort of a war of patrolling, of driving or walking around, never really seeing the enemy, um, and the, the enemy's main threat being bombs, IEDs buried in the ground that you could step on or drive over. Um, but in the patch, uh, it was this, it was gunfights and artillery fights kind of every day. Um, I, I think I never saw so much artillery expended in all my other trips to Iraq and Afghanistan combined um, as I saw during you know, a uh, first week or so at this place, Combat Outpost Michigan at the mouth of the Korangal Valley. Um, but something that was really striking um, during that first visit when I went there um, was it, it seemed like despite all the, uh, the fame and infamy surrounding this really dangerous and violent and high profile place, the origins of, of US involvement there beyond sort of the basic, well, we came to Afghanistan because of 9-11 were pretty murky. Um, you know, I'd go to these outposts uh, along the Pesh Valley floor and ask the, the company commander, you know, a captain in his late 20s, um, to explain what, you know, what his guys were doing there. And, he, you know, of course, could very capably explain what his guys were doing there on a day-to-day -day basis and their task and purpose and mission and so on. Um, but if you asked, well, and, and how did your outpost get here? You know, when was it built and why? Uh, you'd kind of get a blank look um, because U.S. forces had been up there for quite a long time at that point. Um, and because of the way U.S. forces rotated through, you know, units deploying for six months or a year, six months or a year, six months or a year, um, guys just wouldn't know uh, how, you know, when this outpost was first built. You know, it would kind of be, well, uh, you know, outpost was here when I got here. It was here when the company commander before me got here. Pretty sure it was here when the company commander before him got here. You know, might as well have always been here. Um, and so my my initial question was just, how did it get this way? How how, how did each of these outposts first get here when it kind of what was the what was the origin story here um, and so even before I had you know kind of a, a real idea for a book um, that was just the, the question that I set out to <clears throat> to explore initially as a, a senior thesis when I was uh, an undergraduate in college um, was just how did each of these bases get here what were, what were the what were the reasons behind each of them because um you know it was very easy sitting at a place like combat outpost Michigan at the mouth of the Korangal Valley for soldiers living there in this kind of fishbowl, sucking down an enemy fire all the time, to think, you know, only some idiot would have built a base here, right? Only somebody who doesn't care about soldiers or their lives would build a base here. But of course, that's not the case. Um, every one of these outposts was built under particular conditions and with particular information that was available at the time by thoughtful commanders um, who, who, who felt that they were doing the best thing that they could at that time. And that was kind of the puzzle that I was uh, trying to uh, trying to trying to solve was what were those circumstances and what was going through these commanders' heads and what information did they have available to them at the time that they built each of these little bases. So I'll I'll go back to you as to what the answer to that question is sec. But General Vattel, to you. Um, so as I mentioned, you're 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 a character in the book, uh, commander of JSOC, uh, uh, and then of, of Special Operations Command, and then CENTCOM. Uh, you were interviewed for the book, and, and you're even featured in one of the pictures of the book. Uh, so uh, you, you're in there in a lot of different places. Um, and you're But your experience in Afghanistan actually goes back much further than that to the early days of our offensive there. And, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, you parachuted into the country as commander of the 75th Ranger Regiment, you know, maybe maybe six weeks or, or three or four weeks into operation. So maybe you could tell us a little bit in your mind, what was the importance of the Peshawar River Valley to the U.S. war effort? Um, how did it evolve over time, uh, or, or maybe it should have evolved over time, uh, I guess is a different way to put it. Um, and in your mind, how, how did you see this region um, and your various command responsibilities, how do you see this region of Afghanistan uh, as important to achieving the, the overall US war aims? Yeah, thanks, Gabe. And it's great to be with you. And my thanks to the Alexander Hamilton Society for hosting this. And, and my congratulations again to Wes for an extraordinarily well-researched uh, 
book on an incredibly interesting and important part of our experience in Afghanistan. So yeah, um, you know, I, I think when I had retired from the military in 2019, I remarked to somebody that I'd been to Afghanistan for a part of every year between 2001 and 2019, sometimes for relatively short periods, sometimes for longer periods, but I'd been managed to maintain a consistent relationship with the with the country. And uh, of course, when we went in, in, in 2001 and uh, you know, our initial operations, you know, the land operations really started on about the 19th of October. So 11 September, 19 October, almost almost uh, five, five and a half weeks after 9-11, we had troops on the ground. And um, I, I think, as I think back on that period, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. We didn't know much about Afghanistan. Um, we didn't have certainly the surveillance, um, you know, assets that we have now or that we had, you know, at the height of our of our operations there. So there was a lot we did not know and appreciate about the about that country. I mean, my 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 activities and the ones that I supported started in the southern part of the country. And as you will remember, you know, we had kind of a northern and a, a northern and a southern strategy here, where we were kind of working from, from both sides to, you know, to kind of converge uh, on, on Kabul. And, and, our, and our focus was really deposing the, uh, deposing the Taliban, but also going after Al Qaeda. Uh, and, uh, in, you know, as, as that first year closed out 2001, we found ourselves in, in uh, Tora Bora in the mountains, which is, you know, not in the Pesh Valley, but is pretty close to the Pesh Valley. It's getting you into the same type of terrain. So, you know, as, as, we, as we started to get into, um, you know, kind of the sustained operations on the ground, we, you know, established presence in Bagram, you know, I think we had this continuing, continuing concern to keep pressure on Al Qaeda. And I think that's what took us up into, up into the, into the Abbottabad and, and in the broader Pesh Valley area, uh, you know, as early as 2002, I can remember visiting, uh, you know, Fab uh, Abbottabad, uh, Abbottabad, but uh, yeah, Abbottabad, um, up there in uh, Asadabad. I'm sorry, I'm getting my my Al Qaeda locations confused here, Asadabad in, in the Pesh Valley, uh, and, and, and thinking about what, you know, what we were trying to do up there, but it was really about keeping pressure on Al Qaeda. And that was, uh, that was the, the principal, uh, principal purpose. And then over time, as, as you kind of suggested, um, you know, we, we continued to add presence up there and established bases and a variety of, uh, of important, uh, you know, if not strategic, at least tactically uh, important locations to, to create pressure, to create presence up there. And I think the idea was that if we could, if we could establish pressure, you know, presence in this area and we could bring some development to this area and we could start to return normal uh, governance to this area, that this would be a great way to prevent it from being, being exploited by al-Qaeda uh, and other elements that were up in there. So, you know, it was those types of thoughts, I think, that eventually got us into this. I, I would just share one final thought, and it, it kind of, I think, uh, uh, kind of supports a lot what Wes just mentioned. Um, there, there is a mythical quality to this area of Afghanistan. I, I, for anybody that has spent any time up in the Pesh Valley or gone up to Nuristan or been up along the border there, it's, it is an absolutely fascinating location. So there's a certain allure that comes with, uh, with this. I can remember flying from Bagram Airfield as I flew up there and I did it all the time, uh, particularly in the 2007, 2008 timeframe. I was doing it on a regular basis, once or twice a week. Um, you, you know, especially in the summer, you'd fly over, you'd see kids playing in the in the river, uh, and then you'd you'd land at an outpost, and you'd be in this, uh, you'd see this extreme violence. So, you know, it was an area area that had an extraordinarily intriguing um, uh, draw to it. And and frankly, one of the best governors, provincial governors, uh, that we had at the time was up in up in the uh, up in the Pesh Valley. Uh, in in uh, in in in, uh, in uh, uh, that area, and so you know that that gave us confidence that at the time that you know this was a place where we could operate and we could potentially make some difference. So there's a variety of reasons that brought us up there. Most of them are related to you know kind of our operational objectives. That's and that's a great transition to my next question for Wes, which is, you know, so much of the the hardness uh, of the place is defined obviously by the landscape. 
uh, literally the physical landscape. And I was wondering if you, and you, and you do this not only in some pictures in the book, but actually on, on Twitter or over the course of the, your own publicity for the book, you've actually posted a lot of pictures of, of your own uh, that, that don't quite make it in the book. So General Vattel should feel honored. He, he, his picture made it into the book, I guess. Um, but uh, but um, can you give us a sense, like put us, put us into the sense of the general location of the Pesh Valley? Like what exactly are we talking about uh, as it relates to Kabul, to Pakistan? Uh, what was fighting like uh, in the valley? Uh, what did it mean or what did it feel like uh, to be a soldier there? Uh, and then maybe again, because because you do so much, you did so many interviews, and and I think with actual with Afghans too. What is it? What did it mean to be an Afghan uh, in the Pesh Valley and and have the U.S. military, you know, kind of you know come in, let's say, uh, you know, a few months after after the invasion? Yeah. So to describe the place a little, um, you know, I think I alluded to a little before. It's about it's a hundred miles northeast of Kabul, uh, up kind of near the Pakistani border. Um, the Pesh Valley is a, a pretty narrow valley that flows down uh, around the Pesh River uh, from Nuristan province, high up in the mountains, um, down into, across the border into Kunar province, and it joins the Kunar River at the city of Asadabad, which is the place that, that General Votel was mentioning, visiting very early on in, in 2002. Um, now, it's, uh, if, you're, if you're flying over the place, what you see is these little narrow ribbons of green, where it's this uh, the cultivated, you know, cultivated land on the very limited space on the flat valley floors surrounding the rivers um, where people grow corn uh, is one, one, of the, one of the main products uh, that, that people cultivate up there. And then um, you, you see these, these mountains that just, um, they, they go right up in some cases almost cliff-like um, from, these, from these valley floors. Uh, uh, th and they rise up to, you know, to 10,000 feet. In some cases, you know, you go deeper up into Nuristan up to 14,000 feet peaks. Um, and the higher you go on these mountains, you know, from the valley floor, they kind of look brown. There are these lower layers of evergreen oak, kind of sparse forest. But if you go higher up into these mountains, there's really thick conifer forest, big trees, you know, uh, cedars, pines, firs. Um, I was out in I was out in uh, uh, in Glacier National Park in Montana last week, and it kept striking me how how much it, that looks like uh, uh, some of the, the the forests above the Petra Valley. Um, which presents a lot of challenges for the U.S. military that you didn't find in a lot of other parts of Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of where can you land helicopters, what can your surveillance drones see and not see under this, uh, in some cases, almost closed canopy forest. Um, U.S. forces went up there in the spring of 2002, as Gerald Botel was alluding to, um, basically because uh, this terrain uh, uh, presents a good place to hide. Um, uh, Osama bin Laden escaped from U.S. forces at Tora Bora in December 2001, um, and as U.S. Special Operations Forces and, and, and CIA officers spread out around the country, uh, one of the things they were really trying to do was pick up bin Laden's trail. They are trying to figure out where he had gone and where other Arab al-Qaeda operatives had gone uh, when they escaped from Tora Bora. So they were spreading out into all kinds of places around the Afghan East, and one of the places they went was uh, Asadabad at the mouth of the Pesh Valley. Uh, we know in retrospect that they were on the right track. We know in retrospect that this is, in fact, where bin Laden went immediately after Tora Bora. He spent something about six months uh, in a little uh, rugged little valley uh, adjacent to the Petch called the Shigal Valley. Um, and and US, U.S. operators followed him there, but they were always a little bit behind. I mean, they, in some cases, uh, you know, there actually was a big raid um, by, in, involving a, a lot of uh, General Votel's rangers uh, in, in the fall of 2002. Um, that came closer to where bin Laden had been hiding until just a few weeks earlier uh, than I think any of the soldiers, that, you know, the soldiers and SEALs involved in the raid even knew at the time. Um, but they were always a few steps behind. <clears throat> and so what you wind up seeing is um, U.S. forces, they build these little outposts and they're spreading out into these little valleys, either walking or driving in pickup trucks and ATVs, talking to people, um, CIA officers handing out cases of cash to informants. Um, just trying to get information, trying to ask, you know, where did the Arabs go? Where did these Al-Qaeda guys go? And they're not encountering in these early days, they're not encountering fighting or an insurgency um, because this part of the country really did not have much of a Taliban presence um, before, uh, before 2002. Um, the Taliban had taken over the provincial capital, Asadabad, um, but, they're, but it, this is not the Taliban heartland. Um, in, in fact, it's a uh, a, a place um, that's largely populated by people from an entirely different strain of Islam, um, Salafi Muslims, rather than the, the Deobandi um, strain that the Taliban comes from. 
Um, so there actually were a lot of, a lot of groups um, up in this part of the country that wound up fighting against the United States and siding with the Taliban, um, at this point had been fighting against the Taliban. Um, but what you see uh, over the years that follow is uh, the military's footprint gradually expand, um, the mission gradually expand, often in really little increments rather than with you know, big decisions made in Washington or Kabul, uh, but often with much uh, with incremental decisions made by, by colonels and in, in, uh, you know, lower level general officers on the ground who are left to deal with this situation. Um, and are left to decide, okay, well, what, you know, what's going to work here? Uh, you see the mission gradually expand from this very limited, narrow manhunt by a small number of special operators and intelligence officers into this much more expansive counterinsurgency and development effort, um, which, again, you know, conceptually, was, as General Votel said, was always in the service of that original counterterrorism mission. I mean, the idea was always uh, you know, as, as one of the guys uh, in the book, one of the Green Berets who embraces this counterinsurgency approach early on uh, was, you know, we've got some special operations forces that are out there squashing cockroaches. Uh, we've got other forces whose job is to kind of um, cast light, make, make it harder for there to be places where cockroaches can, can stay and where they can find refuge. And that was what got the United States involved in this, um, you know, shift from this kind of pure counterterrorism manhunting um, to this more expansive counterinsurgency where they're gradually committing more and more troops on the ground. Um, you know, first it's these very little JSOC and CIA teams, then it's Green Beret teams, then it's, you know, mar some Marine platoons are committed to help the Green Beret teams, then the Green Beret teams leave and it's left to the Marines and they gradually expand. Um, then the Army replaces the Marines and the Army starts committing, you know, whole infantry battalions um, up to this area. Uh, and that's where, you know, General Votel, um, as the, the, the one-star deputy commander for operations in eastern Afghanistan in 2007 to 2008, he kind of steps back into this situation uh, where U.S. forces have spread out from their initial little base that they had established into a whole network of, of much smaller bases in much more remote valleys. Um, and by that point, uh, you start to see, you know, things start to get violent, um, in part because U.S. forces make mistakes. Um, they, they detain and kill the wrong people, uh, sometimes because they're being misled by their sources um, who are trying to settle grudges or, or commercial disputes, um, which is something you see in the Korangal Valley. U.S. forces kind of get used inadvertently as muscle in a very complex timber trade that they, uh, that they didn't understand going in. Um, and in other cases, it's just sort of the inevitable natural friction of tough fighting um, is that, you know, a, a, as U.S. forces are protecting themselves, um, using artillery to, to, to fight the enemy, um, uh, using airstrikes to fight the enemy. Um, there, there are inevitable mistakes that happen in the fog of war. Um, and, you know, early on, uh, I think uh, Kunari's people up in this part of the country were pretty willing to forgive a lot of these mistakes. They were pretty welcoming of American forces um, and, and pretty welcoming of the, you know, the U.S.-backed Afghan government. But over time, as more units rotate in and more mistakes happen, the population kind of becomes cold to the U.S. presence. Um, and, and over time, what you see happen is <clears throat> these little outposts, which were established in 2005, 2006, 2007, with the intent of being in the counterinsurgency lexicon, um, they were supposed to kind of create little bubbles of security for the population, push the enemy farther into the hills, create safety around these outposts. And so for that reason, they were built by towns and villages. Eventually, you see the opposite thing happen. Uh, and, and these outposts kind of become the centers of bubbles of danger for the population, um, and they draw in enemy activity. The, the, in fact, the Taliban commits more resources up to this area because the U.S. is up there and because the fighting is so ferocious. And so over time, you see it just become this magnet, both for U.S. forces and for the Taliban, and the population is stuck in the middle. So let me let me pick up on something General Votel said earlier, and then and then ask and ask him about what you just said, Wes. So General Votel, you said that. In, in many ways, the, the valley sort of, or fighting this valley sort of achieved a, a mythical status uh, in, in, uh, in the American military community or in the war in general. Um, and as Wes said, and, and maybe he didn't quite put it in these words, but it sounds like the valley was maybe the center of gravity for Al Qaeda type forces, but not the center of gravity for the Taliban. Um, you know, which was probably more so out in, in Helmand and, and, and Kandahar. So, John, tell me a question for you: Is how did how did our efforts in the in the Pesh, how did they integrate in, into those more 
you know, direct, at least in the early days, you know, anti or counter Taliban uh, efforts? I mean, how did the how, how do you how did you balance or how did you see, um, you know, what we were trying to do in, in Wes's book uh, interact with, you know, kind of what we we're trying to do in, in you know, to some degree, uh, maybe the more important, I don't know if that's some my word, but somebody else's word, but more important uh, uh, province, uh, let's say, in Afghanistan. Yeah, I think I think you're asking a really, really good question. And, uh, you know, I, what I would share with you, I think, Gabe, is that, you know, the, for the most part, Kunar province, and certainly the Pesh Valley and the areas, you know, in the valleys in and around that really had always been about Al Qaeda, and that that had really what had uh, what had focused us uh, in in coming to that area. And even as late as, you know, as late as 2007, 2008, when we were up there, I mean, there still was, you know, we were still getting reporting and other things of uh, of Al Qaeda presence, although we never really were able to develop much of that. Uh, and so, you know, the the idea became, and and again. I think it's important to, to recognize that, you know, we had, as Wes alluded to, we had a very um, supportive, supportive provincial governor up there, uh, one that we trusted. And we actually had one in uh, up in Nuristan to the north of, of Kunar as well, that we had very good relationships with that were that were that leaned towards supporting uh, the American effort, the coalition effort there. So it was very, very supportive of that. And we had some success. I mean, the the paving of the road up to uh, uh, um, uh, Asadabad and then down the Pesh Valley. These were all seen as very important uh, development efforts. We had a PRT team, uh, frankly, one of the better. Uh, provincial reconstruction teams, you know, this combination of military, Department of State, other elements of, uh, of the government up there operating in, in, uh, in Asadabad that was, that was quite good, frankly. Uh, one of the best that, uh, that I saw during, at least during my 2007, 2008 period uh, that I was there that were, that were doing, a, doing, a, doing, a, doing a very, very good job. Um, and so I think, you know, it, you know, you saw this blending of our focus on counterterrorism, but also our focus on this idea of counterinsurgency. And this was viewed as an area where we could, we could succeed. It was seen as strategically important up against the border with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Pakistan. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, we were denying, uh, you know, Al Qaeda and others the ability to get in and operate in this particular area. Uh, and so it was viewed as, uh, as uh, important into the overall, into the overall strategy. And again, at this time, you know, for American forces, we were, uh, you know, we were largely located in the east. Um, so, it, you know, we had some forces down at Kandahar, but by about 2007, we were pretty much consolidating most of our efforts up into the regional command east. And while we did maintain some uh, forces <clears throat> down in Kandahar, there also was a much larger coalition presence. So the American effort really focused in the east, and that included these these provinces, uh, Kunar, Nuristan, and then the 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 provinces to the uh, to the south, taking us all the way down into Gaza. Um, so that was that that would that really was where the American effort uh, uh, focused on. So let me, John Votel, let me ask you another question, and, and I'm sort of putting Wes on the spot because if, if the answer is uh, if if the answer is none or negative to this question, uh, it, it might hurt Wes's book book sales. Uh, but um, when when you when you interviewed uh, for the book. Um, you know, having read the book, having read some of the pieces Wes has written around the book, um, what did you, what did you, what did you learn from the book uh, that maybe is different than how you experienced it? You know, looking back on, it's always important, you know, the kind of history and Wes's book is basically captures 15 years uh, or so of history. Um, what do you feel like you, you see or, or might have read uh, from your interactions with Wes in the book that looks different than how you lived it or how you experienced it? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a, that's an excellent excellent question, and uh, you know I think the what I learned about the book and what I think West did such a great job documenting this is the interaction between a variety of different leaders, in particular over our operations that I would say took place from about. 2011 through about 2014 or 15, and I, I you know, was in <clears throat> really in that period in three. I was in almost in three different positions looking at it, and it was amazing to me how much I had did not pick up uh, either as the JSOC man where I was very involved. So you know, one of the one of the things West goes into in the book is this thing called Operation Haymaker, which is when we really get serious about going after Al Qaeda up in the uh, up in up in this area. And it comes, Haymaker comes 
after a time when uh, when some of you know some of our intelligence uh, capabilities have been very very successful against Al Qaeda in Pakistan, and there's an effort by Al Qaeda to reestablish themselves up in the up in the Pesh Valley, up in up in the Kunar province, uh, and so you know we begin the military begins to pick up on that, and we undertake an operation that we refer to as Haymaker, which is really well documented in the in the in the book, um, and uh, and I was happened to be there in the early parts of of, uh, of Haymaker as we were as we were getting that done. But the thing that I really learned from the book was all the interactions that took place really as we as we as we uh, continued to pursue that campaign and uh, uh, and why ultimately uh, it was not as successful as we hoped it would be. Even though it was very successful, we did we did a lot. We did a lot of damage to Al Qaeda, uh, but ultimately it wasn't. It uh, didn't end up being the decisive. Uh, you know, operation that we were looking for and make make the big difference uh, for us in this particular area. And, and, uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. And Wes, I think, does a really good job of going into that. And so I learned a lot just just really reading back. I, I reread back through some of that earlier uh, this morning again. Uh, just, I think, really, really, really insightful in how that campaign started out and how it how it evolved over time. So Wes, I mean, counterfactuals are hard, uh, obviously, and, and it's easy with hindsight to, you know, kind of do things differently. But part of the argument of your book is we were making some of the same mistakes over and over again, and, and that we had lost, at least on the ground, had lost some of the, um, I don't know if it's institutional knowledge or, or, or kind of handing down about why we're doing things and how. So if you could go back, Wes, back to that, you know, first winter, let's say in Afghanistan, you know, what would you have recommended that the United States actually do uh, with regards to, you know, the Pesh Valley, Kunar province, um, and sort of efforts overall? Yeah, great question and a hard question. Um, you know, I think there are um, two different threads as far as um, reasons that, that the US, U.S. efforts in the Pesh wound up not being successful and wound up just dragging on uh, and being really difficult. There, there are kind of the smaller tactical reasons uh, smaller tactical mistakes that U.S. forces made along the way. And then there are really big picture strategic reasons um, that, that things didn't work out. Um, and it can be really easy to, um, uh, it can be really tempting to look at all the smaller, uh, the smaller mistakes and say, well, look, if we had done, you know, this thing better and that thing better and that thing better and that thing better, uh, then maybe things would have gone better. Um, but I don't know if that's true. I mean, I'll, I'll give some examples. You know, one of them, uh, as you've alluded to, is uh, in the war of rotations where units just constantly replace each other. Um, there's knowledge that is just lost and has to be relearned over and over and over again um, during these uh, during these rotations of troops. Um, and there are, you know, there are some. The, the military tries to overcome this problem. It tries very hard to overcome this problem. Uh, and there are some real heroes in the story. Uh, at kind of at the tactical level, there are um, guys from a, a unit called the Asymmetric Warfare Group that General Votel actually had a, a pretty formative hand in creating back in the early stages of the war. But there are these retired special operators who come back in as contractors. Um, there's one in particular in the book uh, who, who really is kind of a hero of the story, uh, who come in and they, they embed themselves with these infantry units and try to bridge the gap uh, during the rotations. And they try to pass the knowledge down uh, and make things go more smoothly. Um, so you look at guys like that and you think, well, look, if we had more of them, if the, rota you know, if the rotations could have gone more smoothly because there were more guys like that and, you know, they're just, uh, there was better, better passing down of knowledge, um, you know, maybe then things could have gone better. Um, or you think, well, okay, maybe if there was some other way of doing the rotations, you know, so that, so that the knowledge wasn't lost in this, in this way that it was. Or maybe if we didn't kill this person or detain that person. Uh, based on you know faulty intelligence, and if we'd been more discerning about that intelligence in this particular incident, you know uh, maybe then things could 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 have could have, gone, could have gone better. Um, and, and I think it's really seductive to think that way, but I think it's also um, you know by by the time U.S. forces really in 2010 2011 identified that they are failing uh, at, at counterinsurgency in this area, a lot of it is because of deeper reasons that uh, that it were probably would have been much, much harder for U.S. forces to overcome, if not impossible for U.S. forces to overcome, um, to include basically what a, a lot of people in the area see as illegitimacy of the government. You know, that there have been, um, over time, there have been some some really good uh, government officials. I mean, I think um, I think it's Governor Fazlullah Wahidi that, that, uh, that General Votel is referring to as the, the really good Kunar provincial governor in that 2007 period. Um, 
but to a lot of to a lot of Afghans living out in the districts, uh, the government is extractive and predatory, um, and and they see it as something that's just you know police and district level officials are extracting bribes from them. The police and the district level officials are extracting the bribes because that's their you know that's their livelihood. That's that's just how it works. Um, and, and so there is this real problem of kind of core uh, you know core acceptance uh, of the government among the people um, who are who are being governed. Um, that you know, by there's a there's a, an officer named uh, Joe Ryan who appears repeatedly in the book. Um, he was the battalion commander there when I first visited the Pesh in 2010. Um, and this was one of his you know real insights that that he made in the summer when he decided it was time to leave, time to recommend his chain of command that we pull out of the Pesh. Um, was uh, it, it felt to him like um, the the many many officials in the government, police officers, district chiefs, and so on. Um, we're not really on the same side as the United States at more than a superficial level. Um, when you're dealing with a situation like that in a counterinsurgency, I mean, that's not, you're not going to get anywhere uh, in the long term. Uh, and then, of course, the other huge structural issue is the existence of Pakistan right next door, um, which, uh, you know, is, it creates a safe haven for the insurgency to operate out of. Uh, and in the patch, you always see this interplay between uh, it's, it, there's almost two insurgencies uh, operating at once. There's uh, there's a local insurgency, just local young men who are who are fighting for various reasons, be it ideology, um, be it revenge over relatives who've been killed uh, either in combat or, 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 or through mistakes um, or for commercial reasons. Uh, but then you also see uh, the Taliban, um, you know, coming in from across the border in Pakistan and using this area as kind of a, a playground and a, in some cases almost like an exercise area, an equivalent to uh, uh, you know, the US National Training Center or Joint Readiness Training Center. I mean, there's a, a guy in the book named Dan Kearney who was one of the company commanders uh, working for General Votel in 2007 to 2008. Um, and the way he put it was, he, he thought a lot of these outside fighters were coming to the Korangal um, essentially to get their version of a Taliban combat infantryman badge. I mean, this was like a, a, an initial testing ground for, uh, for fighters who'd gone through some type of training in Pakistan um, and were being, you know, were being sent to sort of a, a capstone exercise before they would graduate to go on and fight in other places in the country if they survived. Um, so the, the presence of this, of this sanctuary right next door um, is definitely, I mean, a huge factor, a huge structural factor um, that, that undermined U.S. efforts from the start, and that really there was never a, you know, a solution for. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I would say, if you go back, uh, you know, the very early years is whatever you're going to do, do it quick, um, because there is this, there is a half-life to, to U.S. efforts there, um, where there are these huge structural factors that are undermining everything you're doing, and then also the longer you stay, the more this kind of friction comes into play, the more you kill people by mistake, the more you get, more often you get played by local sources. Um, so, you know, if, if there was, if there was anything uh, that was going to be successful, I think it would have had to have been something, you know, pretty short term, um, something that, that's done kind of more quickly before this half-life just gradually erodes everything, all, all the success that you're able to have. I, I want to just jump in on what, uh, what Wes just said, because I think that is, this is the big lesson right here. And I think it is the big takeaway. And it is this idea of going heavy early on, on these types of problems. I mean, when you think back to December of uh, November, December of 2001, when we were chasing uh, bin Laden in Tora Bora, uh, we had more ability to go after him and we chose not to. And uh, I mean, there's a variety of reasons that we did that. Uh, some of those we wanted the Afghans to do it. We didn't want to get overcommitted, but this was the opportunity for us. And, uh, and uh, you know, we had, we had very, you know, we, we are talking about Pakistan right now uh, in the difficulty of the relationship that we, we certainly had, certainly by this time, 2007, 2008 and beyond, uh, and, you know, it continues to this day in the most part, but there was a time in 2001, 2002, where we actually had a, where we actually had a cooperative opportunity here and our inability to really get get uh, get our forces focused on the most important things that we were after, which at this time was Al Qaeda, uh, uh, I think, really, really uh, limited us in the long term. And, and that, there, that was our opportunity to, uh, to do things. And, and, and unfortunately, it was fleeting. Uh, and then we were never able to uh, ever never able to reconstruct it, even with Herculean efforts. Uh, to try to do that. We just could not uh, 
recreate the opportunity that had been missed in the early years of getting after this. So I, I want to ask one more question um, on if something happens in the book, and then and then ask a couple questions about you know where we stand today, uh, because even though there's an epilogue in the book, the book more or less concludes I'd say about you know kind of four years ago, let's say or or, or so, uh, which is this question of ISIS, um, which is actually you know uh, which West talks about in the book and certainly relevant to you, General Votel, uh, as, as commander of CENTCOM um, and the counter ISIS coalition. So uh, Wes, maybe first you can just kind of talk about there's there's sort of an interesting. Um, kind of weird almost, uh, you know, that that's being diplomatic, maybe uh, kind of dynamic uh, with the with the entry or arrival of ISIS uh, into the narrative of of our our uh, part in the in the Afghan war and its impact on the dynamic between the Taliban, Afghan forces, our forces, et cetera. And, and you talk about it in the book, obviously, and then you expanded on it, um, you know, even more assertively, I think in a Washington Post article, um, you know, about six months ago or seven months ago. So maybe for you, Fess, can you, can you kind of explain to us a little bit, what's that dynamic, how it look on the ground? And then for you, General Votel, afterwards, like I said, a, a CENTCOM commander um, that oversaw operations to, to roll back the ISIS caliphate in Iraq and Syria, what did the emergence of ISIS in Afghanistan mean overall for for not only the the counter ISIS efforts but also for actually our, our efforts in Afghanistan um, and and the reason it made me think of that is what you just mentioned which which both of you mentioned but General Fatih you kind of foot stomped which is you know early on we had this you know opportunity maybe to go after Bin Laden and others harder and we chose not to you know you didn't say it but partially there's the Iraq War partially there's other operations going on in different ways and so this this ISIS um, you know, variable, um, you know, kind of makes me think of that too. So Wes, maybe first over to you, you can talk about like, how did that come up and and, and what did you see happening that, you know, sort of seemed a little bizarro-ish, maybe is, is one way to put it. Uh, and then General will tell you is sort of how did that impact uh, both wars that you were you were uh, managing? Sure, yes. I mean, the, the basic situation that, we're, that we look at up in this part of the country in the recent years is that you know, whereas everywhere else in the country, you essentially see a two-party war between the Afghan government with its U.S. backers on one side and the Taliban on the other side. Up in Kunar, there's a third actor, and that's the Afghan branch of ISIS, as they say, ISIS Khorasan, as they call it, ISIS-K. Um, ISIS-K showed up, um, started bubbling up in Kunar uh, around 2016. Um, <clears throat> sort of for narrative purposes, it was an interesting way of winding the book down, because basically, um, as U.S. forces finally killed the al-Qaeda guy that they were after in Operation Haymaker, a uh, figure named Farouk al-Qahtani, uh, who was a you know, pretty senior al-Qaeda guy that they were hunting for years and years and years, right as they kill him is when this new enemy uh, is, is kind of bubbling up uh, in the same old valleys where U.S. troops were fighting, and that's ISIS-K. Um, now, what ISIS-K is is kind of a complicated question. You know, at, at a surface level, what it is, is it's the Afghan branch of the Islamic State, of the global caliphate. Um, but at a more granular level, uh, what it often is, is these same old Salafi groups, these groups that were, you know, lo local militias and militant groups that were often not a natural fit for the Taliban, but fell in with the Taliban against the shared enemy of the United States. Uh, uh, they, they actually, these Salafi groups, in some ways, have a, a more natural fit of their ideology uh, with ISIS. Um, so in 2016, 2017, 2018, you see a lot of these little local militias and you know strongmen up in these valleys um, lower the white flag of the Taliban, in some cases literally, and, and raise the black flag of ISIS um, and say, you know, we were Taliban, now we're ISIS. Um, and so the, the big question, um, you know, for, uh, for the U.S. military and intelligence community becomes, well, how ISIS-y is this ISIS, right? I mean, how much of a how much of a of a global threat? How 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 real of a part of the global caliphate? Uh, and uh, you know, how real of a possibility is there that there that you know international attacks could emanate from this from this ISIS branch? Versus how much is this the same old local actors? You know, the same people that we've been involved that you know that sucked us into these disputes over timber in the Korangal. How much is it just a you know a, a new a new flag on the same old local thing? Um, but so what you see happen is um, uh, instead of this two-party war, government versus Taliban, um, there's a, a three-side war, government, Taliban, ISIS, because the Taliban and ISIS don't get along. In fact, they, they fight tooth and nail. Um, so what you see is the government, in some cases, reaching accommodations with the Taliban in this one part of the country, even as they're still absolutely going at it in this brutal war of attrition with the Taliban everywhere else in the country. Um, to find common cause against ISIS. 
And so the, um, you know, the, the thing that, that Gabe's referring to is in basically the six months preceding the Doha agreement, uh, you know, so late 2019 into 2020, there is this strange development. Um, it's almost too, too, too strange to be true, but it is, it is indeed true, um, where uh, the Ranger Task Force, the guys at Bagram who are charged with hunting Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they actually, you know, they're, they're looking at the, you know, the government is making these accommodations with the Taliban. The Taliban is fighting ISIS. At, and so the Ranger Task Force actually um, starts using some of its same old intelligence tools, the tools that it's using to figure out where to hit the Taliban every else, everywhere else in the country, you know, listening in on their, on their radio chatter and so on, um, to figure out at kind of a, a narrow, lower level, tactical level, um, what, what, what does the Taliban need in its fight against ISIS? And so they'll do things like, you know, listen in on the Taliban, figure out that uh, a particular Taliban unit is going up a particular hill, uh, you know, the next morning to capture an ISIS position, uh, and that they are particular, you know, they might be particularly worried about a certain machine gun nest or something, and then use a drone strike to take out that machine gun nest. So you have, e even well at the strategic level, the United States is hammering the Taliban, going after the Taliban to bring it to the table at Doha. Um, at this tactical level, in this one narrow corner of the country where the counterterrorism interests at play are very different, um, you actually have the Rangers using drone strikes against ISIS to help the Taliban because the Taliban is fighting ISIS. Um, and there's, uh, you know, at the, at, ba at the Bagram headquarters um, that, that General Votel used to run, uh, some of the Rangers involved in this targeting, I mean, they, they jokingly called themselves the Taliban Air Force, the particular little team that was involved in doing this. Um, I think it's something that left kind of a queasy feeling with some of the Rangers involved. But um, a, 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 as one of the guys who I was talking to put it, um, you know, a, 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 one of the Rangers, I mean, yeah, look, we, we in the JSOC task force, we would love to be out there every night fighting this thing, you know, doing it ourselves. Um, but you also, especially for the guys who've been in the task force for a really long time, you know, NCOs who've done 15, 16 deployments, field grade officers who've come up in the, in the Ranger Regiment going to Afghanistan over and over and over again, there's kind of a recognition that that going out there every night and doing it ourselves hasn't worked. Um, uh, and, and so that there may be a, you know, a time to embrace more creative solutions. Um, but it's an interesting glimpse into kind of, you know, it's almost like it's, a, it's an outsourcing of one aspect of the counterterrorism problem to the Taliban, right? It's uh, because the Taliban is opposed to ISIS. Um, it's, you know, relying on and helping the Taliban um, fight that fight. Um, now, the, the sort of the complicated, um, one of the complicating things here is that the Taliban still has its own international terrorists, right? Um, so even as even as it's fighting against ISIS, it continues to harbor and host Al Qaeda, the original the original terrorist that we went there after. Um, so it's sort of a you know maybe a little bit of a glimpse at uh, at, at something that we might hope to see uh, in the future as far as what we what we can rely on the Taliban for post post uh, post withdrawal, but only against that one narrow enemy, which arguably is not the important one, right? I mean, there's uh, if you're looking at ISIS K versus Al Qaeda. Um, I think there's a, a pretty strong argument that ISIS-K is really not an international terrorist actor, even though it is a local franchise of an international terrorist actor. Whereas Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, the international terrorist actor, uh, remains very closely allied with the Taliban. Um, and we, you know, we, we, we remains to be seen what, uh, what the Al-Qaeda-Taliban relationship will look like uh, going forward. General, how did how did that vignette that Wes kind of play out, you know, at the at the, at the grand strategic level, let's say, of actually trying to manage both these campaigns and 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 win both of these wars and them intersecting? Yeah, no, and I think this uh, I think he very uh, very succinctly captured the complexity of the whole region, and and what it what it takes to operate here, and and what uh, what are what we're putting our young men and women, uh, the situation we're putting our young men and women in to sort out. Um, and it's it just to me, it just highlights the complexity of the area, you know, in uh, in Iraq and uh, in Iraq in particular, um, you know, we had, we were fighting essentially alongside uh, Shia militia groups supported by Iran who were also focused on on uh, on ISIS. And so uh, while I, I would never characterize this as in the, at least in the in the Iraqi theater, there is is we didn't do strikes in support of them or things like that, but we also didn't we didn't impede them. And there was a level of cooperation 
uh, there was a, uh, I want to say a level of cooperation. That's a very strong term. There was a, there was, you know, somewhere between deconfliction and, and cooperation here, where they, we knew they were, they, we, we were aimed at the, at the same enemy here. And so we did not try to get in their way. And we had to figure out ways to operate collectively. And uh, fortunately, in, in Iraq, we had the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi forces who could do that. And, uh, you know, we were very closely aligned with uh, an Iraqi commander who spent the majority of his time every day just knitting together these different elements that were fighting against uh, uh, against uh, against ISIS. Uh, and so, you know, that that what you saw was you saw the, as Wes described, kind of the Afghan version of that. We didn't have necessarily a host nation partner who was, who could be that interlocutor. And so we had to find, you know, our, 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 our our, our forces had to figure out ways to have ways to do that on the uh, on the uh, on the ground. But again, what ISIS represented, you know, and there, there's a fair amount of concern. I mean, this is a ultra violent, very aggressive uh, uh, terrorist organization who isn't just about sowing instability and, and striking back at the Americans, but in the, you know, at least in the Iraq and Syria instances was about governing, was about, uh, you know, establishing the institutions of governance in these areas. So there's a real concern about this. And as we watched uh, these other so-called franchises of ISIS rise, whether it was in the Khorasan or whether it was in the Sinai or whether it was in other places here, uh, there was a real concern about this. I mean, we were, we were, you know, uh, we knew we were looking at the next, uh, the next uh, migration of, uh, of terrorism in the region. So uh, it had to be, had to be addressed seriously. And in doing that, we, you know, these types of arrangements that both Wes and I have talked about here, I think were necessary uh, for us to prevail against them. So last question for me before we turn to some audience Q&A and just a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them in writing via the Q&A chat and then we'll you know, call on people and unmute them, but um, which is basically talking about the present moment um, and not only the present moment uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, but the present moment in Washington, uh, which is the, the administration's, um, you know, it's not it's certainly not the first administration to announce a, a, a withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan. It's the third. Uh, you know, the, the first two, um, you know, didn't quite make it, let's say, um, but this one seems to be, uh, seems to be the case. So General Vettel, maybe first for, for you, um, what do you think about the president's decision to withdraw all forces to, from Afghanistan? Um, what do you make of these reports that we may leave 650 troops to, to guard, seems like the embassy and, and maybe the, the Kabul airport? Um, how would you, um, uh, uh, you know, I think we talked about soft line briefly about something else, but how would you compare the situation in Afghanistan today um, to the situation in Iraq in 2011, uh, when the Obama administration withdrew uh, all American forces by the end of the year? So I, I'm kind of curious your take on that. And then Wes, on your end, uh, from what you see, uh, what's the situation in the Pesh today, given the American, you know, withdrawal from, from the rest of, of Afghanistan, you know, where do you see the situation on the ground like in, in three months time or six months time, so. Well, uh, thanks, Gabe. And I think, uh, I think uh, you know, comparing and contrasting Baghdad in, in 2011 and Kabul in 2021 is a, is a useful way of thinking about this. It's the way that I think about this, frankly. You know, and, and in, in, uh, in 2011 as the JSOC commander, I was making very strong recommendations about the importance of leaving uh, some element of CT capability on the ground to continue to preserve our interests and maintain our relationship with, a, uh, with, um, with, uh, with the Iraqis. In the situation in, uh, in Baghdad at that time, and while I don't think the, you could ever hold the, uh, the Iraqi government up at any particular point to be a paragon of democracy or stability, but, but it was fairly stable. Um, you know, there were not a lot of attacks. It was, a, it was a much, much different and calmer situation in 2011 than it had been in the previous years. And so there, you know, there was a, a situational reason why we could be looking at a reduction of forces in this, even, even, even if, uh, if we were gonna leave something else. Uh, when you contrast that and look at Kabul today, it's not the situation. 
this is not a government that is uh, that is well entranced uh, in in performing its its duties as uh, as, as much as they have tried to do that. Uh, the military, the Afghan military, still has a long way to go. Uh, this has been a real challenge to rebuild this and give them the capabilities. Uh, you know the. Iraqis had some had some uh, some muscle movements in terms of this that they could fall back in on. Uh, we've had to really develop that with the with the Afghans, and it's been a challenge for a variety of reasons that we've talked about: corruption, bad leadership, bad support, uh, you know, uh, and then just a you know a different uh, a challenging uh, you know a challenging population to um, to work with here. So I, I think these are really two different situations, and I don't feel very good about what we're doing here. I do think it's important. I, I would have made very strong recommendations to, to leave forces on the, you know, an element of our CT capability on the ground and continue to watch our, 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 our efforts and to maintain a relationship with the Afghans. I think it, I think it matters. You know, it's, it's always instructive to think about when you think back to Iraq. In, in 2011, we did leave some forces, the small forces. We left two ODAs with the counterterrorism service on the ground in, in Iraq. They stayed with them until we came back in late 2014. Uh, the, the, the impact of those two uh, ODAs on, on the counterterrorism service was significant. It kept that force together. So our subsequent response to, uh, to ISIS when we went back was all built around the counterterrorism service because they had stayed together. And it took a, it took a small just a small contribution there of forces on the ground uh, to do that. So, you know, we shouldn't overlook the uh, the power of, of small uh, focused uh, presence on the ground in terms of these areas to watch after our interests. And I was hopeful that we would do that. Uh, and we've obviously chosen not to do that. Uh, there are some things we can do here over the horizon and uh, certainly with perhaps some security cooperation and, uh, and perhaps that's part of the role of some of this 650 that we're that we're hearing about, although I don't have a lot of details on that. Uh, certainly, a part of that is security, uh, but it is important, I think, to continue to um, to have some skin in the game in terms of this if we're going to look after our our own uh, national interests. And, uh, and so, I am I'm very very concerned about how this how this plays out in Afghanistan. It's a much different situation than what we saw in 2011. Wes, before going to you, let me just a quick follow up. Why do you think we're not doing that? I mean, you just kind of made the case that it seems like well, I, I think, we, uh, I think our, our national fatigue with Afghanistan has really kicked in here. Uh, the narrative of forever wars has has really has really captured uh, a lot of our policy decision making here. I mean, this isn't the this isn't a decision that was just made by the uh, by the Biden administration. I mean, the, the Trump administration put us on this path in a, in a big way. Uh, you know, the last two years of my time at CENTCOM were focused on creating the conditions so that we could bring the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan to the table for the purpose of getting ourselves out of there and, and coming to some kind of political resolution. So this is the this is the direction we've been moving um, for um, for some time. And the, and, the, and, the, and the power of that narrative of forever war that, you know, we're continuing to be drug into this, I think is very, very powerful. And people are just, people were just tired of it, particularly in the policy world. And so, uh, I think that has played a lot into this. Um, we forget that we still have troops in Germany, that we still have troops in Japan, and we still have troops in Korea, decades and decades and decades after conflict, and that this is the nature of making no, making decisions to put forces in there. You're not just making short-term decisions; these are long-term decisions. So we've got to we've got to really think about what our objectives are, and we've got to be able to stay with it. Uh, and we've been we've been challenged in Afghanistan with what our strategy has been. Um, and we started out very clear, and it's it, it wandered um, over time, and uh, and and that wandering gave gave license for this fatigue to set in, and now we're seeing the impact of that, I believe. Gotcha. All right. Wes, what, what do you see on the ground right now, and, and what do you think it'll look like in, in six months' time or so? Um, so looking at Kunar and the Pech, I mean, I think in some ways we're already seeing the future, a potential future play out. The U.S. forces have been gone from that part of the country for some time. Um, they, they haven't been playing the same kind of advisory role that they, that they still have more recently in many other parts of the country. Um, so, and, and, you know, especially with this glimpse we've seen of, uh, you know, the Taliban going after ISIS and the United States sort of helping them with that. And I think that's sort of a, that's a, a potential sort of best case future that you might look at. Um, 
I think, you know, what, what, what things will look like in Afghanistan, the, the big events that are going to happen over the next year, they're not going to happen up in the Pesh and Kunar. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's possible that the Taliban will make some kind of big renewed push to take district centers or even to take uh, the provincial seat in Asadabad. But I don't think that for them, uh, this, is, this is the strategic part of the country. I mean, I think we need to be, we should, we have to be looking at, at the south and at the north, at the big cities, at the districts surrounding the big cities, you know, very far from this, in some ways, kind of a backwater, Kunar, um, uh, to, to see what will really happen in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, uh, I, th I think the analogy to 2011 is, is an interesting one, the 2011 in Iraq. Uh, and I'm very curious what General Votel thinks of um, you know, to, to what degree, I mean, actually, I, I know one of the Green Beret team commanders that he's alluding to who stayed post-2011 uh, in Iraq uh, under the auspices of the embassy to continue working with the counterterrorism service. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, what General Votel thinks, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind kind of taking this question just real quick, of, you know, what, what could be accomplished under the auspices of the embassy? I mean, given, given how vastly more violent, you know, Afghanistan in 2021 is, uh, than Iraq in 2011 was, the very different security considerations for U.S. forces, even in Kabul, let alone anywhere else outside of Kabul. You know, what, what, what's still possible, both in terms of, uh, you know, partnership with, uh, uh, with Afghan Special Operations Forces via the, the embassy, you know, Office of Security Cooperation construct, and then also what's still possible from a CT perspective? I mean, just thinking about the huge, uh, the huge challenges involved with the distances you know, flying, flying reapers in from, flying drones in from the Gulf, all the way from the Persian Gulf, you know, such that they have very limited time on station, probably can't carry full payloads. I'm just curious what, what, uh, what you think is still possible. Yeah, thanks. That is a good question, Wes. You know, certainly I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of security cooperation throughout this whole region, especially with Afghanistan. I think it's important that we have a security cooperation office that continues to, you know, ma make sure that uh, Afghanistan, you know, whether it's con contract or logistic support for the for the capabilities that we've given them, A-29s or other aircraft that they have that they're relying on to make sure those, uh, those that though they continue to be supported. And again, there's a variety of ways we can do that in country, out of country, um, as we move forward. But I think it's really important to uh, to continue to have a security cooperation capability. So I think like, like an OSC, I think is possible. I also think it's possible to have kind of a CT advisor element, whether that comes under the embassy or not. I think can certainly be debated and talk about that. Uh, they could certainly be co-located in in Kabul in a secure location to continue to, you know, provide advice, to provide intelligence, to provide. Uh, uh, other support is necessary to help the help the Afghan forces be more effective in their in their in their in the conduct of our operations. So I think there's a variety of things. You know, we shouldn't lose sight that we've done this before. You know, uh, our very successful campaign with the Syrian Democratic Forces in in uh, northern Syria began with a remote relationship where we were in uh, in bases in uh, in northern Iraq and they were operating on the ground in in northern Syria, and we figured out ways to communicate to them uh, and to and to provide support to them. And and they were very 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 successful. In terms of doing that. Um, so I, I, I would never underestimate the ingenuity of our people to figure out how to do this. Um, it probably isn't, you know, the best solution probably isn't going to be prescribed, certainly not by a retired four star or by a senior commander. It's really going to be determined by people on the ground who have a clear mission uh, and who are given the, given the, the a leeway to exercise some initiative in, in figuring out how to best do it. I think we can figure, I think we could probably figure something out. Let me let me go to questions um, and just uh, I'm going James Beckwith I'm going to you and just as a reminder please identify yourself and and also uh, tell us uh, to whom you are addressing the question. Hi, uh, my name is James Beckwith. I'm a student at St. John's. Uh, this question is for either uh, General Vodal or uh, Wesley Morgan. Um, so I was curious, sort of in the background of the rapidly deteriorating situation in Afghanistan and the recent um, intelligence estimate of a possible uh, collapse of the Afghan government within six months. Um, how either of you see uh, Dostum's recent return to Turkey um, playing in with the Taliban seizing a majority of northern districts and sort of how that bodes for the prospects of the traditionally anti-Taliban elements in northern Afghanistan uh, being able to resist these advances? 
So I'll, I'll jump in first here. I, I mean, I think this is, uh, um, this is the culture of Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, I, I think, I think we, we could see uh, these so-called warlords, people like Dostum and others kind of coming back to exert, exert their own authority in areas because the central government is incapable of doing it. Uh, there's never been good, strong relationships between people like Dostum and the central government. Uh, and that has been very, very strained. Um, so, you know, we should, we should expect that this is certainly one of the outcomes that, uh, that we could see here. Um, you know, when you think back to what Afghanistan looked like back in 2000, 2001, before we showed up, it, uh, it, it had these kinds of features where you had warlords who were controlling areas, uh, exerting influence, doing their own foreign policy, reaching out and talking to people um, and, uh, and trying to, you know, form partnerships. So I think this is unfortunately a natural, uh, natural state of things in, in Afghanistan, and we shouldn't be surprised to see more of this. Wes, anything to jump in on that or? I've got nothing to add on the North. I don't, I don't know the North. Okay, great. Uh, Ryan Touchstone, uh, over to you for your question. And again, please identify yourself and, and address your question to, or let us know who you're addressing your questions to. Hi, I'm Ryan Touchstone with uh, Liberty University. And my question is for both the speakers. With the Kunduz province coming under almost full Taliban control and the recent attack and the border crossing with Tajikistan pushing Afghan forces into Tajikistan, how do we think Central Asian countries and Russia are going to respond to these increased Taliban movements in the north? Well, I, I would just share with you that in, in some regards, Russia has been responding and the Central Asian states have been responding to this for a while. You know, they're uh, in Tajikistan in particular, there's, you know, a, a significant presence of Russian capabilities and they routinely were exercising down along the border. So they're going to take this seriously and, and, it, and, uh, and they're going to do it for two reasons. One, because uh, it, uh, it will, it will, it can be used and publicized to demonstrate the, uh, the ineptitude of the American and NATO approach and, and be seen as another kind of kick in the gut uh, against this effort. But secondly, be because of their very legitimate concerns for extremism in uh, in that part of the in that part of the world, Russia is very concerned about this. And when you look at the flow of ISIS fighters that went to Iraq and Syria back in the uh, back in the 2010, 11, 12 time frame here, as uh, as that was uh, as that was getting underway, this was one of the one of the primary places people uh, people came from. So they're very vulnerable to this. So they are going to take measures to secure their own borders and make sure that they are addressing any fallout problem that comes from uh, comes from Afghanistan. I think that I think you're going to see that with all of these Central Asian states. Some of them have a more developed relationship with uh, uh, with Russia. Um, in many ways, uh, for the United States, there is opportunity in this as well. Um, the Central Asian states are important to us. We don't think very much about this. I mean, this is the this is the historic. Uh, trade routes of the of the Great Silk Road, um, so it's an important area, uh, and it's an area where we can have some influence. And again, through security cooperation, through relatively small, sustainable um, efforts that we make, we could we could we can we could do the same thing that Russia does with some of these partners and and help them uh, um, in in preventing uh, the outflow of some of these problems from Afghanistan from impacting them. I think it's in our interest to do so. Wes, anything else on that or? I'll pass on the big, big geostrategic picture. All right. Well, I'm mindful of the, of the clock and I actually do want to close on something, um, you know, I think important to everybody um, and in the news recently. And, and uh, Wes, you, you actually dedicate the book um, uh, to uh, many of the interpreters. Um, you know, I think not only the, the ones you met and the ones you, you know, you interacted with, but also just largely, but basically, Many of the Afghan interpreters um, who, in many ways, we probably couldn't have conducted operations uh, whatsoever. Um, and I know, General Votel, um, you're also very active and, and concerned about this issue um, as, as we seem to be accelerating our withdrawal. So I just want to kind of give, give you both an opportunity, maybe Wes, a little bit in your end, um, in terms of why you chose to dedicate the book to them, and General Votel, on your end, is to you know, what is the question about these SIVs, these special immigrant visas, what is going on, you know, what we all uh, might be able to do to, to help um, in different ways. And so I just wanted to end on an opportunity to give each of you a few minutes to just to just talk about what the issue is and, and, and why it's so important. 
Um, and then we can talk about the moral issue and promises made, but I think there's also in some ways a larger question here, which is, um, you know, the United States will likely have to engage in these sorts of operations somewhere else, uh, again, at some point in our future. Um, and if we, if we aren't, you know, relied upon to fall through on our promises to some of the folks that helped us, um, that took great risk to do so, those operations might, might become a lot more difficult. So anyway, so Wes, I don't know if you want to say why you, you kind of dedicated the book to these, these people, and then General Vattel sort of, you know, what, what others can do or where you see the importance of it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I dedicated the book to the interpreters who helped American soldiers, Marines, sailors stay alive up in, in this part of the country during their long and difficult time there. You know, this was a really hard and long war for the United States uh, throughout Afghanistan. Uh, up in the patch in the mountains that surround it, uh, almost all of the difficulties that U.S. forces have experienced are magnified. Uh, that's true. You see that with the terrain and the vegetation and everything, making everything so much harder for drones and helicopters. You also see it uh, with the ethno-linguistic landscape of the place. Um, the, the Pesh Valley uh, is a place where uh, people speak Pashto. Many of the security forces speak Dari. And then if you go into the side valleys like the Korangal and the Waigal and the Wadapur, and people speak uh, different languages altogether. Um, old Pashai and Nuristani languages that are mutually unintelligible with one another, uh, let alone with Pashto. Um, so U.S. forces were in many ways uh, even blinder in this part of the country than they were in other parts of the country and more reliant up here um, on interpreters than they were anywhere else in the country. Uh, and, they, and they needed higher quality interpreters, interpreters who could speak not only speak English and Pashto and Dari, uh, but in, in many cases, ones who could speak Waigali or Gambiri or Kalasha Allah or, or, or Paransi. Um, uh, and so, yeah, interpreters, interpreters kept American troops alive. They kept American troops alive, and they also they helped provide the continuity that the military lacked um, in the same way that, um, uh, you know, guys from the asymmetric warfare group did. Um, interpreters had a longer time scale. Um, you know, uh, when, when I last went up to, to the patch a few years ago, um, I took as my interpreter a guy who had spent about three years working for three successive U.S. infantry companies in the patch. Uh, who was, he was, his family was from the Weigall Valley. He had been badly wounded in a firefight, um, you know, helping U.S. troops in the patch. Um, the company that he worked for really had not served him well. He did not receive anything like the kind of, uh, you know, medical treatment and, and recovery that U.S. troops receive. Um, uh, so, I mean, they were, you know, besides being incredibly useful sources to reconstruct this book, um, uh, to reconstruct the story for this book. I mean, they really, um, a, lot of, a lot of these guys were real heroes of the story. I mean, and even if they weren't, uh, you know, the ones firing their rifles out there, which in some cases they were, by the way. I mean, there were plenty of interpreters who uh, commanders entrusted them with, with weapons um, uh, and, and to, fight, to fight alongside them if need be. Uh, they played a really, a really critical role. And I think, uh, you know, what, what U.S. forces did achieve up there along the way, uh, a lot of it is very attributable. Um, to these interpreters who fought, who, who, who worked under the absolute most difficult circumstances you can imagine, and for much longer at a stretch than U.S. forces ever did. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Wes covers it, uh, covers it really good here. I think there's a moral imperative here to do, to do what is right for those that put it on the line for us uh, during our time there. And, uh, you know, the, the process that we use is through this special immigrant visa. It is a bureaucratic process. And I understand some of the reasons for that. We certainly should be careful about people that come into the country and, and we make sure we do this. But in this particular case, uh, this is one where we need more attention, more urgency and more focus. And frankly, the, the mechanisms to do this have been deconstructed over the last several years and it's been made more difficult. A difficult process has been made more difficult by our, by our own lack of focus on it. Uh, and of course, we've done a lot, uh, myself and a variety of others, uh, much more so than I have done a lot to raise this issue and it's brought some attention to this. Uh, but I am concerned that we are doing too little too late uh, with this. And uh, there still are a lot of interpreters and their families who are going to be very vulnerable if we don't get them out. So it's we've got to continue to uh, to focus on this. This was a, this was an important promise that we made to them uh, that they would be eligible to apply for this uh, if they met certain criteria. And now it's it's uh, it's incumbent upon us to see this through. So it's really important. I would just close on this. I I come from St. Paul, Minnesota, in the late 1970s. Uh, as the Vietnam War was coming to its conclusion, uh, we brought 
Vietnamese, particularly Hmongs, uh, to the United States, and a huge number of them ended up in my in my town here of St. Paul. And you can't go anywhere uh, without seeing the influence of them in, in our culture. And it has largely been a positive and a progressive one. And it, uh, while the Vietnam War did not turn out the the way that we had hoped that it would, our support for the Hmongs, uh, I think, really under, under underscored our commitment to the people that that served with us and fought alongside us in, uh, in, a very, in another very long war that, uh, that uh, led to a lot of disillusionment with us. But it was the right thing to do then, and it's the right thing to do now. And for our viewers who are still on, if you can send a note to your Congress and your members of Congress, if you can reach out and support an organization, uh, a charity in your area that is uh, helping settle these people, um, and if you can raise the voices on the imperative of this, that 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 would be helpful. It is very very important that we that we do this and we follow through with our commitments. Wesley Morgan, uh, General Vitale, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Wes, congratulations on the book. Uh, it's, it's, as I said at the beginning, it's not only an important book, but also a great read. Um, uh, really, you, know, you, have, you have a wonderful gift of narrative um, and being able to tell a variety of complex stories um, into a narrative. So congratulations to that. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Hope to see you with our next webinar, which is on, on July 13th um, at noon uh, Eastern time with David Albright. Uh, on um, Iran's perilous pursuit of nuclear weapons. Um, and until then, hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.